Amen. We appreciate the good singing, and as always, to set the stage, uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy. Going to see what we do today. Not exactly sure, I uh, mentioned to Brother Dean Wednesday night, what I thought I'd be uh, preaching on. He come in this morning, says, is, is it the same? I said, I think so. And then as the morning went on, I said, well, I'm not sure I'm actually going to get to the message. I think the pre-message might take up the service and we might get to the message tonight. But it'll set the stage for the message uh, is my prayer. Uh, so we will see. But I'm going to try to talk a little bit out of this morning out of 2 Timothy. The thought process that has been on my mind all week is service. Service. Very simple word, very easy word. We know what it means. Uh, we know what it uh, consists of. And can I say this, that every child of God, if you're born again, if you're a child of God, been born again, bought by the blood, placed in the family of Christ, you should have a deep desire to be used of God. You should have a desire to be placed into the service of God. Not dodge it. How many times, and our church is no different than every other church. You may go to a church, and you go in and say, well, that church is different. We all fight the same problems. The problems in our churches, I intended on saying this, but it's true is that 10% of the people do 90% of the work. 90% of the people are perfectly content to let that other 10% do it. When we should all have a desire, if you don't believe me, you let me get up here and stand up and say, I need someone to help do this, 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 and this. There'll be some that'll stick their hand up, will come up here, and I've noticed over the years that that's the busiest people in their, in their lives to begin with. And then there'll be others that, Sloop down in their pews. Hopefully he won't see me. I'll just stay hid back here behind somebody else. Amen? Am I being honest? Amen. Absolutely. And it's not just here. It's in every church. Everyone I've ever been part of, been, see, been in, uh, for any reason, that's just it's the way it is. But it shouldn't be that way. We, for, we should look for opportunities to serve. I want to talk about service. That was my intentions to get to, and I'm going to talk about, whenever I get to the message, which I have a feeling is going to be tonight, about the, what God looks for from a person to use in His service. What kind of person can God use in His service? That's where I ultimately want to get to. I told Brother Dean my problem was, when I started to uh, start out here, and I would read a verse, and I'd say, well, I need to include that. And I'd back up a little more, well, I need to include that. And I'd back up a little more until I've backed way up, and I'm afraid I'm not going to get all the way to where I wanted to be. But that's okay. We'll lay the groundwork. Uh, those that are back here tonight, we'll talk about that. Those that I don't make mad will come back. And anyway, 2 Timothy, great book. The great apostle Paul, the last of his writings, in prison, writing this book, to a very young man, Timothy. He's young in the ministry. He's young in age. And he has been placed over the church. And Paul has concerns about Timothy. Not what kind of person Timothy is, not what Timothy is teaching. Paul just knows that because of his age, he is susceptible to certain things. And so Paul is trying to encourage him, exhort him, strengthen him, in the service of God. All going back to service. Real quick, I'm going to give you five titles, five uh, different titles that Paul gives in this uh, book of 2 Timothy that he gives here for, the, uh, uh, for a Christian. Uh, here in chapter number 2, I should say, in 2 Timothy, he gives us five things. Number one is found in verse number 1. He calls Timothy, my son. If you're a child of God, you're a son. Amen? A son of the king. In verse number 3, Paul says, Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. 
So he tells us that if we're a child of God, we're a son of God, and that we are on the battlefield. We are a soldier in a war. Amen? Soldiers serve. They serve at the discretion and the command of their officers, of their higher-up uh, officers, their commanding officers. We are no different. We're a son of God. We're a soldier in the army of God, and therefore we should serve. The third name that he gives is found in verse number 12. We don't like this name at all. If we suffer. So we're a son. We're going to be a soldier in the army of God. Well, we're going to be a sufferer. Every day is not going to be peaches and cream. Amen? Every day is not going to be a shouting day. Every day is not going to be uh, the day that you want to live the rest of your life. You hope it's not that groundhog day like Bill Murray had. Amen? Uh, you don't want to relive that day over and over because sometimes suffering comes our way. Suffering that we don't understand. Suffering that we can't explain. But in the scope of eternity, in the scope of time, it all comes back. So we're a son. We're a soldier. And because of that, we will suffer. The fourth name that he gives is in verse number 15. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. So we're a son. We're a, so, uh, we're a soldier, we're a sufferer, and we're a student. We're supposed to study the Word of God, the ways of God, the things of God. You say, preacher, I get in trouble a lot. You never get in trouble studying the Word of God. Have you noticed that? Amen? You never get in trouble when you're somewhere alone with God, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God. You never get in trouble. Say amen. amen. I just started. Amen? And I'm different from a lot of preachers. If you're not responding back, I don't take that as a, as a, uh, as a cue to quit. I think I hadn't got through to you yet, so I'm going to preach and preach and preach. So if you don't respond, we'll be looking at each other at 2 o'clock. And your bellies will be growling and mine will be growling. Amen? But Karen knows I can go all day without eating. So I'm here for the long haul. Amen? So we're a son, we're a soldier, we're a sufferer, we're a student of the Word of God. And then what we want to preach about is found in verse number 24. The Bible said, And the servant of the Lord must, stri uh, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. But the servant of the Lord. So we're a son of God. We're a soldier in the army of God. Uh, we will suffer for the cause of Christ if we're a child of God. We should be a student of the Word of God. And we are a servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot disagree with any of that. I just read you the Scriptures. Amen? If you're a child of God, this is where you are supposed to be. I want to talk about service. Out of the book of 2 Timothy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the privilege to be here today. Lord, I thank you for every home that is here and represented. Lord, I know that we have several that are out uh, traveling. We have some that are not feeling well. Uh, Lord, and then we have some that are just filled so full of apathy that they just didn't get up and get here this morning. Lord, for them, we pray for all of those. Those that are sick, we pray that you'd uh, make them feel better. Those, Lord God, that are traveling, give them traveling mercies. And Lord, Lord, those that could have been here and aren't for whatever reason, Lord, we love them. We're not mad at them. We're not upset at them. We love them, and we just simply want you to bring them back to the house of God. We want you to trouble their heart. And may they realize the need to just be in the house of God, to be around God's people, to be under the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. Father, we just pray that you deal with their hearts. Father, we thank you. We love you. Deal with our hearts today as we talk about service. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And I know some of you think that I'm mad this morning for some reason, and I'm not. I will promise you I'm not. I love my church. There's some people that aren't here that I love and I miss, that haven't been here in a while. And I want to see them come back. I'm not mad. I just know the importance of being at God's house. I understand how easy it is to get out of uh, the, the routine, for the lack of a better word. I've said this before, we're creatures of habit. 
You miss three Sundays in a row, you're out of church and didn't even realize it. We are creatures of habit, and we set our priorities, don't we? Every one of us have our priorities, and we've got them in a certain order. And I remember, and I'll get to the message, I remember one time when I worked at a plant, Wilson Art, they made countertops, uh, laminate, and I worked there for nine years. And I remember one time I went into a company meeting, and the man that was directing the meeting, he looked at the people, I started to say congregation, it was far from a congregation, uh, but he looked at the group of workers and he said, the problem we have here is our priorities are out of order. And I'm thinking, he's right. But then he couldn't shut up, he went on. And he said, your job should be first. Your family can come in second. And your church can come in third or fourth. And I thought, under God, he's got it just backwards. Your God should come first. Your family should come second. And I'm not sure where the job fits in. I don't think it's even third. But it's in there somewhere. But God should always be first in our list of priorities. And our family should always be second behind God. You mean our family shouldn't be our first priority? No. You make God your first priority and all those other things will fall in line. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. God should always be first. Amen? Should always be first. I made a mistake this morning. <laughs> Shouldn't say this. I made a mistake of, uh, I was trying to find something on our website. And I couldn't find uh, what I needed. But when I typed in, I, just, I said, well, the quickest way I typed in West Corinth Baptist Church on Google. Well, it pops it up over there and it said 15 reviews. I thought, what? So I clicked on the reviews. Some were left by this church people of this church some weren't I got tickled at one four stars we live by that don't we we got to have our likes and our stars da, da, da. four stars the church was great friendly people great children's program but the pastor was a little over the top for me <laughs> I've not even got to the top yet amen you didn't know me when I was 20 some years old but I'm gonna get there you hang on amen so anyway, ah, God love it. Anyway, let's, I'm going to back up now. I told you I kept backing up and backing up and backing up. And I want to go back, talking about service, I want to back all the way up to uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and read a very familiar verse in number 7 because I think it has a lot to do with service. The Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Now, I think many times we uh, quote that scripture. We use that scripture uh, sort of out of context. Uh, we read into it what it really doesn't mean. Uh, what it doesn't mean is uh, that, uh, that you're afraid of snakes. I don't like snakes. One liked to give me a heart attack the other day. I walked up and I was about four or five feet from it, and it was about five feet long. And it was a black snake. But I didn't know that when I first saw it. And he didn't have a sign telling me he was there, and I, I about jumped out of my skin. Once I saw it was a black snake, I was okay. But, so maybe you're afraid of snakes. Well, you shouldn't be afraid of snakes because the Bible says that God's not give you the spirit of fear. That's not what he's talking about. Well, you don't want to climb to the top of the tallest tree because you've got a fear of heights. But the Bible said that God has not given you the spirit of fear. That's not what it's talking about. There's some healthy fear. Amen? Uh, you should be fearful or have a great respect for snakes. There's a lot of them will kill you. Amen? But that's not what it's talking about. The word there, fear, if, you, if you'll research it out, it means fear cowardice. What it means is that it doesn't matter what's going on out in the world, uh, that God didn't give you a spirit of cowardice that you would be afraid to stand up for what's right. That's what the Bible's saying. 
I thought you was talking about service. I am. If you're afraid to stand up for God in what's right, you're not much good in the service of God. The Bible said God has not given us the spirit of fear. He has not given us a spirit of cowardice uh, that just because we're in a crowd of people that may not agree with us, that may not like us, that may not love us, that may not love God, that don't want to hear about God, that don't want you praying over your meal, it means that you should stand up with a backbone like a saw log and you serve God. I don't care who's around. God has not given you a spirit of cowardice. Stand up. You're a child. I just read to you, you're a son. You're a child of the king, amen. We don't bow in cowardice. God didn't give us that spirit. God tells us to stand up. We're his child. And a father will protect his child against all enemies. And when I grew up, I knew my dad would take care of me. But I also knew my dad couldn't be with me all the time. But my heavenly Father Amen. said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with me wherever I go, whatever crowd I'm in, whatever's going on in my life, uh, he's there with me. And he says, brother, he says, son, uh, looking at me, he said, look, I didn't give you the spirit of cowardice. Uh, don't you worry about that crowd that don't want to hear about the gospel. Uh, you just do what I tell you to do, and I've got you back. Amen. I've got your back. I'll take care of you. Uh, I know what's in front of you. I know what's behind you. I'll watch, your, I'll watch for you. You just do your service. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. And then there's that little three-letter word. But. But. Well, okay, he's not giving me this, but. That means he has given me something else. For God, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, of cowardice. Do you understand that fear, cowardice, those emotions, they'll hinder your service. They'll keep you from serving God. We cannot let that happen. He says, but of power. Power. Power doesn't come in your physical stature. I'm 6'3", 200 pounds. I carry a pretty good force with me when I come. But that's not where power comes from. Will's quite a bit smaller than I am. He's a strong little rascal, I'll tell you that. But he's a lot smaller than I am. But power doesn't come in physical size and physical ability. Power comes from God. And God says, I give you power. I've given you what you need to go into the world and be successful. I've given you what you need to go out and complete successfully the service, the work that I've faced in front, placed in front of you. So don't be a coward. I've given you the power. And if you're holding the power and you've got the power of God backing you up, uh, what should we be afraid of? Who should we be afraid of? The Bible says if God be for us, who, shall be, who can be against us? Amen. If God's on my side and I'm doing God's will and He's given me His power, what do I have to be afraid of? So He says, I didn't give you the spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love. I think that's very important. And I believe the reason God put that there was many times if we feel like we've got power, we want to exert that power over someone. Don't we? Say amen. Amen. We want to exert that power over them. Show our dominance over them. Show that we hold all the cards. We're in control. We call the shots. You're going to do it my way. God said, I will give you the power. But you've got to wield this power in love. Because you've got to, I've give you my power, but I've give you my love. And you've got to reach out with a heart of love. Now sometimes love can be tricky. Because if you truly love someone, you tell them the truth. If you truly love them, you don't beat around the bush. If you truly love them, you don't fail to tell them something for hurting their feelings. If you love them. You don't sit back and watch them get hurt if you can prevent it. God said, I'll give you the power. But you've got to wield and use this power with a heart of love, reaching out to others like I reached out to you. 
For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What does that mean? That means that you make rational decisions. Amen? We make decisions every single day. Thousands of decisions. You made a decision to be here this morning, and I'm thankful you did. Some made a decision to stay at home. Some could not be here for whatever, and they made a decision to tune us in online, and they're watching it live. So we make decisions. But God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear or cowardice, but I've given you my power, I've given you my love, and I've given you the ability to make sound decisions. I'm giving you the ability to think something through. So if we've got the power and we've got God's love and He gives us a sound mind, that means we should engage this before we engage this. Amen? Guilty. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself, church. How guilty are all of us of engaging our mouths before we engage our minds, before we let love? What if we only said things that were motivated by love? How would that change our conversations? If everything we said was motivated by love, it's like I told someone the other day, you might say something that's right. Say something that's true. But if you say it in a harmful, hurtful manner, it's wrong. Just because it's true, just because it's right, if it brings heartache and hurt to someone else, then we shouldn't do it. Amen? Or we do it in a manner that they know we're coming from a heart filled of love. Heart filled of love. I told you I wouldn't get to my message because I'm not anywhere close to it. So for God has not given us the spirit of fear or cowardice. Cannot let that control our We cannot let our emotions and, and, and our, our fears keep us from serving God and hinder our service of God. I'm going to get on back over here where I meant to start. Uh, let's start reading in verse number, uh, I'm going to start in verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Studies, we talked about a student, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How can you share and serve in the army of God if you don't know, if you haven't received your orders? You know where you get your orders? From the word of God. If we don't know the Word of God, if we've not studied it and found out ourselves, there are people, probably within our church, God forgive me, that I could stand up here and tell you a 100% biblical lie and they would believe it and may even share it. Don't take my word for it. Study. Make sure I'm telling you right. Study to show thyself to prove. It pleases God when we study His Word and we want to know more about Him. How many are married? Raise your hand. Oh, a whole bunch of us are married. Amen? Now, when I got married, I didn't ask my friend, think I should marry that girl? He says, oh, that girl's wonderful. She's great. You should marry her. Okay. No, I got to know her. I picked her up on the first date. I took her to the Pizza Hut. I was high class. I mean, I took her to the name brand place. We went to the Pizza Hut. And we had our lovely dinner. And then I took her home. And then we went out every single night. For the next, I think it was either 18 or 21 nights, we went out every night. If anybody can stand to be with me that long, they got to love me. Amen? <laughs> every night. Not to mention the time on the phone. I'm just thankful they didn't have cell phones then because they charged by the minute. 
I would have been broke. I mean, I was eat up. But I had to learn it for myself. So I asked her questions. And do you like this? Do you like that? And, and, and I, I studied her to learn more about her. Same way with God. Don't take my word for it. Study to show yourself approved. So you can have that relationship and then you can share it. Now then I go home, I'm ready to bring her home to mom and dad. So they're going to say, well, what kind of girl is she? Now I've got something to say, don't I? When somebody says, well, what kind of God do you serve? You need to be prepared to give an answer. Well, I said she's about this tall. She's this tall now. She was this tall. I said she's about this tall. Beautiful, brunette, pretty eyes, great smile. Beautiful girl. I knew something about her. She likes this, this, very competitive. I know that because she liked to race cars on the way home. I saw the policeman. She didn't. <laughs> she got the ticket. I didn't. <laughs> Being the loving boyfriend I even was, I called her when I got home said, you got a ticket, did you? <laughs> I said, you got pulled over, didn't you? Yeah. Because she had that little four-cylinder and she'd wind that thing up. And I had a big V8. And she couldn't stand it when I would beat her. She was very competitive. So you learn all these things. Same way about God. Amen. We learn these things about God so we can share them. How can you share a God with the world that you don't know? You can't. You can't. Let me move on. The Bible goes on to say, uh, not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat if doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Listen, verse 18. These two men here, these are apostates. Listen. The Bible mentions Hymenaeus, I believe it's in chapter 1, verse number 20. And it mentions him there also. Philetus is not mentioned again. But these, these were apostates. What do they say? Uh, of whom is uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, listen, saving that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. In fact, if you want to go back to the first chapter, and I won't do it, but you read about Hymenaeus there. And Paul said he's turned him over to the devil. What Paul was saying is, I put him out of the church. That'd probably help a lot of churches today if they put some people out. And they could probably start in a lot of pulpits that teach falsehoods and lies. He said, I put him out of the church because he's erring. He's teaching wrong. He's teaching that the resurrection is already past to overthrow the faith of some. So what he was doing, he was in the church telling lies. Some of the people were believing him because they had not studied to show themselves approved. And it was causing the people of the church to err and go the wrong way. We just come full circle, didn't we? And Paul says back in chapter 1, for that reason, he said, I turned him over. I put him out of the church is what he's saying because he's leading the church astray. So let's see what the Bible says here. So they're teaching that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some, not everyone. Listen, if you're a child of God and you're a son and a soldier and a sufferer and a student and a servant for God, if you're all these things, you need to be grounded in the Word of God so when those falsehoods come your way, you don't stray. There's not a person on the face of God's green earth that could ever convince me that God doesn't love me, that could ever convince me that God didn't send His Son to die for me, that could ever convince me that God didn't save me. I've got it settled, amen? Because I've studied the book. I've read what God said. I know what He asked of me. And He said He would do everything else. My part was easy. Just confess and believe. Sin didn't come naturally to me, amen? And it did to you too. But God said he'd do the rest, and I trust him to do so. But then, we're going to see my favorite word in all, this, all these verses. 
Here's Hymenius uh, and Philetus. And they're teaching lies in the church. The next verse, number 19. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Hallelujah, amen. amen. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. What does that mean, church? That means that it doesn't matter if false men are in the pulpits. God's Word stands sure. It doesn't matter if there's people in the house of God that are causing problems and teaching lies. God's Word stands sure. Every church, every church without exception has a Hymenius in it, has a Philetus in it, but it also has some Timothys in it, amen? That love God, want to serve God, want to worship God, want to learn more from the Word of God, want to get in there and do something for God. Those false teachers, those false apostates, nevertheless, God's Word still stands sure. The church will always be filled full of loving disciples of God, but there'll always be a Judas Iscariot hid somewhere in the congregation. Amen? That'll try to hinder and cause trouble in the house of God. And they may cause a little trouble, but the Bible said, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. It goes on to say this, having this seal. They were very familiar with seals. A seal typically had two sides. This seal that we're talking about has two sides. Listen, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, side one, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Amen? Let me tell you something. God knows who's sitting in these pews this morning, and God knows who's saved, and God knows who's not. God knows who's here to worship and serve Him. God knows who's here to play games. Amen? You might fool me. You might fool your Sunday school teacher. You might, you young people, you might fool your parents. You might fool a lot of people, each other, but you'll not fool God. He knows if you're a child of God or not. He knows if you've been saved or not. If you have, He's put a seal upon you. And you can play the part, you can look churchy, and you can wear your dress and your ties and your, and your suit, you can look the part of a child of God, but God knows if you've been saved or not. You'll not fool God, amen. And there'll be no stowaways in heaven. You're not going to grab a hold of my coattails to make it, amen. Because I'm headed that way. One day God's calling us home and I'm going, amen? And I hope it's when I'm preaching. I'd love for him to call me right out of the pulpit, amen? But I don't care how. Well, you say, I wouldn't like that if I, if I had to fall over dead here. It'd traumatize you. It'd be okay with me, amen? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I just want to be quick. I'm ready to go. Hallelujah. I'm ready to go. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, two sides. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Church, that should comfort you. That should comfort you in this, in this day, in this world that we live in, the upheaval that we're in. Everything going wrong. You finish one thing, and, and now they talk about what the, the, the monkey flu or monkey something. I don't know. I'm worried about that one because my dad told me I act like a monkey half my life. I'm sure I have that gene, amen. It's bound to get me. But we can't let our cowardice, he didn't give us spirit of fear, amen. We can't do that. So I, it's good to know that everything that's going on, I've told several this week that the only problem we have in America, everything, every problem we have is with position. It's all about position. What do you mean? It's Joe Biden's position in our government that's causing all the problems, amen. It's all about position. We've got the first, side of the first side of the seal is, the Lord knoweth them that are His. You should say amen. You should say thank God, amen. No matter what happens, God will never forget me. He knows me. The Bible tells in the book of John chapter number 10, if you want to go back and read, and I won't take time in verses 3 through 5, you'll read that the Bible says there, Jesus said that He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. The sheep hear His voice. The sheep will follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow one that they don't know the voice of. Amen? 
You go read it for yourself. A stranger's voice they won't follow. They know. You put, a, you put a daycare together. Leave me out of it. But you put a daycare together with all those screaming and yelling kids running around everywhere, and you let one mama come through the door and just say, son or daughter, all that noise going on, they'll hear. They know mama's voice. They'll come because it's familiar, it's safety, it's hope. We'll know God's voice, and we will not be led astray by voices that are not God's. Amen? Try the spirits and know they are of God. We will not be led astray. So, go, first side, the Lord knoweth them that are His. But then to flip it over, and let everyone, and that means if God knows you're His and you're a child of God, now this is, this is you. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Wow, uh uh-oh. Now, preacher, you're starting to meddle. That's just when it's getting good, amen? I know I'm where I should be when you're squirming. When you're looking at your watch. Is he going to stop now? Listen, God knows where he is. He's put a seal on us. He knows that. So now, he says, now that I know you're mine, and you know you're mine, now you should, as the Bible says here, that we should depart. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It means to get away from sinful things. Don't come in here and sit in the church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. Don't wear your Christian t-shirt. Don't go out here in the world and invite someone to come to West Corinth Baptist Church and then turn around and live like hell. Don't do it. You know what you're doing? You're bringing hardship upon God and His church. You're bringing hardship upon this church, and you're bringing hardship upon me. Don't do that. If you're going to live like that in the world, then don't mention our church, and don't mention my name. Don't do it. We are supposed to get away from those things. Flee from those things. Run from those things. Not let that be part of us. We're supposed to abstain from those things. Depart. Here in a few minutes, we're going to depart. What does that mean? That means you're going to leave, doesn't it? You're going to depart the church. You're going to the house, the church house. You're going to depart the church house. You're going to leave. So if you depart from iniquity, it means that you leave it. You go from it. You get away from it. You don't hang around it. You don't just hang around on the outskirts to where you can peek in every now and then, to where you can keep tabs on it, to where I could just, it's sort of like getting in a swimming pool. That's the way we look at it. We dip our toe in. Well, that don't feel too bad. So we go ahead and step in a little bit. We just wet up to our ankles. And then we get used to that. See, you get used to the temperature. And then you deal with it a little more. That's what sin will do to you if you don't get away from it. You dip a toe in, you get comfortable. You dip your foot in, you get comfortable. You dip your leg in, you get comfortable. The Bible said to depart from iniquity. If you're going to claim the name of Christ, if you're going to tell people you're a child of God, if you're going to be associated with this church, if you are a child of God, He sealed you, He knows you, then you should abstain. You should run. You should flee. You should depart from evil things. The Bible tells us to shun all appearances of evil. Appearances. Amen? What does that mean? Young people, I'm going to tell you what that means. That means when you get old enough and you're, let's say you're, uh, I don't know what the drinking age is. Is it 18? 21? 21? Okay. So you're 19 and you're out with your friends. And they know you come to church here. And you're out with your friends and and they're 21. And they've got this big spread of alcohol. Well, preacher, I was there, but I was representing our church and, and I didn't drink anything. The Bible said to shun all appearances of evil. Now, the person that drives by and sees you, they go, oh, he's not doing that. He's there because he's part of the church. No, what they say is, I saw one of them West Corinth members down there with the rest of them that was drinking and carrying on. Amen? And I said young people because I started out at a young age. It works the same way for for our older people. we got to shun all appearances of evil. 
I'm trying. See, I've not even got to my message. Uh, I do want to get through about two or three more verses, and I'm, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to give you the message tonight. Verse 20 says, but in the great house, this is the great house, right? The house of God. But in the great house, they're not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And some to honor and some to dishonor. As I said, every church has its Timothys and every church has its Hymenaeus and Philetus. Every church has its disciples and every church has its Judas Iscariots. Every one of them. Every one of them. But here's what I want you to see right here. And I hope this will be encouraging to you. They're not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Can I, I want you to understand here that God's blessings, God's rewards, God's gifts, they are not based on your position. They are based on your faithfulness. Let me say that again. They're not based on your position, gold and silver. You don't have to be the pastor, I'm not saying I'm gold or silver, but you don't have to be the pastor, you don't have to be a deacon, you don't have to be this, you don't have to be that. They're not based on your position. They're based on your faithfulness. Be faithful in where God has put you. And if you're faithful where God has put you, then you'll be honorable in the service of God. Some to honor, some to dishonor. It's not based on the hierarchy that the world would see. See, we, we look at and we, we place everything according, you know, we've got a little scale. Well, this person has this job or this, so they're more important. Not in God's eyes. In God's eyes, we've all been created equal. God loves us all. What He is saying is we're not, we're not going to receive these things because of our position, but because of our faithfulness. Be faithful in what, wherever and whatever God has called you to do. Just be faithful. Do it. Amen? Listen, the people that clean our church don't go to our church. However, if they weren't faithful to clean this church, it would get dirty in here, wouldn't it? And who wants to come like that? Who wants to wade through dirt and, and grime and, and, and trash? There's trash. You look in the floor when you leave, there'll be candy wrappers, which I don't understand. This is the house of God, amen? You wouldn't leave it to the floor at your house. You surely shouldn't leave it to the floor at the house of God. But there'll be candy wrappers, and, there'll be, and some things get dropped by mistake. I understand that. Candy wrappers, there'll be everything. It's got to be clean. And listen, just dirt comes off of us, off our feet. We walked in outside. We walked across the parking lot. We're going to carry dirt in. We don't want to come here dirty. We don't want to come to church dirty ourselves spiritually. We want to be faithful. We want to be honorable not some to honor not or some to honor and not to dishonor two more verses i'm going to stop if a man therefore purge himself from these from what from the sins from all these things purge himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work i'm gonna close with verse number 22 speaking to young timothy he said flee also youthful lust but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee also youthful lust. Now, when I say youthful lust, we think of sensual sins, don't we? Every one of us does. But if you'll study this, it goes way past that. When you're in your youth, Timothy's a man in his youth. He's a young man. Paul is telling him, Timothy, you're young. You've got a great work of God. He loved Timothy, called him his son. He knew that he was, he was sold out to the cause of Christ. But what he's saying is, you're young. Back it up chapter 1, verse number 7. You've received power. Don't let that power make you become a dictator in the church. Don't let that power raise you up in pride. These are all youthful us. When we're young, you know what we want to be? We want to be somebody. Don't, don't be raised up in pride. Uh, don't do those things. The Bible said here to flee also youthful us. Well, if you're fleeing from one thing, you have to be getting closer to something else, don't you? Amen? If you go outside and you're 
almost to your car and a, and a rabid dog comes up, you're going to flee the dog and you're going to run for safety in the car. When you flee from one thing, you're running to another. So what do we run to? Well, the Bible tells us. Aren't you glad the Bible tells you that we should uh, fo- uh, excuse me, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, listen, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So he's saying, Timothy, flee those youthful lusts. Flee all these things. This is not just for our young people. It's for them. It's for you too. Flee those things, those sins. Go towards righteousness and and love and all these things. You go towards those things. But you don't go at it alone. You go with them. Is that not what it said? Did I read that wrong? Peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, you leave those things, but you you attach yourself to people that love God. And they'll help keep you on the straight and narrow road. They'll help guide you in the right direction so you can be used in the service of God. You attach yourself to them people with them. It's hard to go alone. Get in a crowd of like-minded, God-fearing people. Amen? God-fearing. That, see, that's, that's a, a profitable fear, the fear of God. It's not a fear that if I do wrong, God's going to strike me dead. You know what it is for a child of God? It's a fear of disappointing God. That's the fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. No, not us. We're not going to be cowards. Not going to be cowards. But a power and of love, and of a strong mind. This is what God's given us the power, and so we need to flee those youthful lusts. Amen? Tonight, I'll get to the message, and we'll talk about what God looks for in a person to serve Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank You, Lord God, for the privilege to be here today. I thank You for our church. I thank You for Your love and Your presence. May we take the Word of God and apply it to our hearts and lives today, Lord. May we study to show ourselves approved. May we dig in the Word of God and find out more and more about You. Father, I pray that we would flee from those youthful lusts and the, and the sins that so easily beset us. And Lord, we would strive towards that finish line. We would strive to finish life well. That You could look at us and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, I believe it was chapter 7 in the book of Matthew that we never want to hear those words uttered where you say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I know you not. Father, I pray you deal with the hearts and the souls of those that are here today. If there's one lost, I pray that you convict them of their sins. May they come and find me after the service. Allow me to take the word of God and show them what it says about salvation. I thank you and I love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's go ahead and have our ushers.